Who drawn first? Um, that'd be rude not to, would it? Yeah. I'm, I'm going green tonight. All right. Okay. What are you going for? Well, don't well, tell me. Got... We'll, we'll wait until we. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, let's wait until we get a few people watching. You get some anti anti glare glasses, but the other way around. So they you don't get glare them. You. Yeah, you get them for actually. Uh, you get anti glare uh, lenses for this way. You know, for when you're driving. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a new house for you, so. Well, indeed. And you step forward. We're not used to seeing you without jumping around the screen on the internet. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, so yeah, um, welcome guys to tonight's Blether with um, with myself and Russell and our guest uh, from Dramful, the founder and um, chief whiskey picker, I suppose we could call him. Uh, Bruce Facker will be joining us in just a second. Um, we we couldn't have, uh, have a Blether last week. We were too busy uh, hosting other events, so... I think you were, were you on gin last week, Russell? Uh, I was, I, I was on the, no, I was on Glen Goyne last week. Oh yeah, the Glen Goyne, yeah. So uh, Goyne, yeah, we had Glen Goyne in Dallas. Yep. Who uh, was a previous fixture in our our yeah. uh, with season? Um, I'm surprised that only lasted an hour. <laughs> entertainment persona. Uh, no, it was two hours. Um, entertainment personified. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so tonight we've got down slightly different. We're going uh, to speak to one of the independent bottling companies um, uh, in Dramful who have really started making a name for themselves. Um, they've, they've got a great tie-in uh, with Jim McEwen in his kind of final years in the, the business. Um, and it's great that it's actually put a spotlight on them because they've, they've been putting out some absolutely stunning whiskies. Um, I'm going to be enjoying some of those. Uh, we'll chat about them tonight. Uh, so, yeah, it's great that People are recognising them in their own right uh, and getting more and more uh, into the dram fool. So we'll just welcome uh, Bruce in. Good evening, Tamara. Good to have you back on with us tonight. Hello, Bruce. Hello. How are you? Yeah, I'm very good, thanks. It looks so, quite. A, yeah, good, good. It looks quite a grey sky out with you tonight, is it? Yeah, it's it's, it's been dry all day though, but it's it's been overcast, yeah. You, usually I'm getting blind, blinded by the sunshine sitting here. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll believe that, uh, maybe just this once. Um, I'm actually pouring your your high parkland. Um, oh, yeah. From, so for those who, who are watching, you might have uh, been attended. We had a drum full tasting uh, with myself and Bruce. I, I made a cameo appearance on it uh, about oh, maybe a month ago, six weeks ago, yeah. something like that. Uh, unfortunately, it was the day after I had my COVID uh, first vaccination. So here was me sitting with all these wonderful drams, um, and I couldn't smell them, and I couldn't taste them, and it was it was horrible. It was torture. So uh, this is the second half of the drams. I've got the two uh, Glen Marvelous and the High Parkland. I'll be sampling uh, in your company tonight. Um, but as we always say, the uh, the blether is not about promoting sales is not about uh, pushing people to get to the shop or, or the like. It's about talking to you, who you are, what it is you do, and uh, hopefully just getting people interested in... Um, I don't think we've had an independent bottler as such um, in our Blether series oh, yeah. um, yet. So we had Andrew Smith from Little Brown Dog, but we really kind of focused on the gin there. Um, so great to have you along. And you know, we'll maybe have a chat about the inner workings of maybe cast selection and and how you go about doing your your business um if you know it's just really a, a chat to get to know you as i say if anyone has any questions uh for uh bruce or indeed myself or russell please feel free to uh, to, to pop them in the the posts and uh, we'll do our best to answer them uh so bruce just you know what what is it you do? Uh, what what is the the essence of Dramful? Um, well, it, it's funny because people refer to me as an independent bottler. I actually don't do any of the bottlings. I'm really an independent label. 
I suppose. I sound like I'm in the record industry or something, but no. It, um, <laughs> it's, I'm an independent label. So basically, um, I don't have any bottling facilities. Um, not yet, anyway. Maybe, maybe further down the line. But um, I basically am offered casks through various sources, through brokers of whiskey. Sometimes I'm approached by members of the public who bought casks as an investment. And usually most of the casks that I buy, I have to buy them blind. So basically it's, a, it's not necessarily a gut feeling or a gut instinct you go with, but I know what distillery the whiskey's from. I know what wood it's in. Um, I, I'm given the age, the strength, and the, the volume usually. And you just have to go on experience. I mean, I've had my fingers burnt once or twice with casks that have been a bit on the light side. Um, but you've just got to judge, yeah, that's lost um, an appropriate amount of spirit in its time, or that's hardly lost any, so that suggests the cask is inactive, and so on. And uh, you get to know the people that you buy the whiskey from, the cask from. So there's a couple of brokers I deal with who I haven't had a bad cask from them yet. Every time I buy one, it's good. So when I buy the cask blind, uh, most of the time, these casks are sitting in Diageo warehouses, or they might be sitting up at Inver Garden, or they might be sitting in Colburn or Tamatin. Um, and they're not necessarily whiskies from those distilleries. As, as, as you well know, uh, casks are shared around to kind of spread, yeah. spread the risk so they don't put all their eggs in one basket and lose all, all distilleries, lose all their stock in a, in a warehouse fire. So um, they're all over the place. Most of these warehouses aren't interested in pulling out a, a cask that Bruce Farker has bought um, to sample and send me a sample and, and re-gauge it, etc. They're not interested in that. I'm, I'm just a, 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 you know, I'm a tadpole in, in, in the Atlantic Ocean, basically. So what I have to do is I have to arrange for that cast to be collected by a, a bonded uh, haulage company they'll go and pick the cask up and they'll deliver it to one of the three facilities that I'm now using to, to keep my casks and also sample and, and bottle them. So once I get the cask moved to a location where I can get a sample, I get a sample drawn, I get the strength taken, I get it re-gauged, to, just to make sure it ties in with the, the figures, uh, you know, based on the figures that I bought the cask, you know, why I bought the cask, you know, those figures. Um, and then obviously the, 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 the man from Del Monte moment is when you pop the, <laughs> the, the top on the sample bottle. And usually as soon as you remove the cap or the stopper, you can tell if it's a bad one. And um, that's, funnily enough, that's what I do. And it's only, you mentioned the, the dealings I've had with Jim McEwen. And um, I've only been working with Jim for a year, but that's what he does when he looks a whiskey when he evaluates a whiskey he tries to pick out an off note he tries to find bad things about a whiskey first and i was doing that six years ago when i first started drawing fool that was what i thought i thought right focus on what's bad about the whiskey and if you if it's bad you find anything bad about it that's it it's rejected but if you can't find anything bad about it you then try and find the good things in the whiskey on the nose and on the taste so i always nose it neat and then taste it neat, and then add a, a small amount of water, you know, maybe even only 10% water, so it's not a lot of water I put in, and then nose it again, and then taste it again. So that whole process usually takes me at least 20 minutes per whiskey to do that, and then based on that, I then decide, yeah, that's a good whiskey, I'll bottle it. The problem I have is if, if it's a bad whiskey and I put a cask blind, then I'm stuck with a cask. So you can either, some of the brokers I buy from, if you're not happy with the cask, you can approach them and they say, well, we'll try and sell it on to our clients for you. And uh, you usually use, lose about 10% of the value of the cask, you know, cost-wise when you do that. But I'd rather lose you know, 200 to 1,000 pounds or whatever on, on a cask than, than wreck, wreck my reputation. So 
I've only had to do that three times. Once I lost by selling back to the broker and twice I actually uh, moved the cask on via one of the auction houses. And um, in doing that, I actually made a bit of a profit, believe it or not. Uh, and they had actually sampled the whiskey and put tasting notes of the whiskey on, on their website. There was no reserve on the cask. I just let it go for what, what it was going to go for. So that's that's the kind of... Um, I'm kind of stuck between a bit of a rock and a hard place with, with, with cask selection. The the ones I buy from private individuals, um, I've always had the opportunity to taste the whiskey first. Because normally when a private individual is, is selling a cask, they get the cask is gauged and sampled. So you've got up to date strength and volume figures and you've got a sample to taste. And um, I have been offered some real howlers from a very famous distillery that I'm not going to mention. Um, it's, it's, it's famous for having a particularly bad off note um, and the 20% of the casks that have been offered from that distillery have that off note in it and I, and, you know, I wouldn't touch it with a barge pole. Um, but generally the rest of the whiskey is very good. So ultimately that's what I do. Um, I, I'm not really in a position, although my position has changed slightly because I'm now working um, with my business partner, Colin Fraser. He came in with me 50-50 on the purchase of the McEwen casks. So although it's bottled and marketed under the Dram Fool brand, it's, it's a completely different product, obviously. It's, uh, I'm not, it's a premium product. I'm not saying Dramful hasn't bottled any premium products. It has in the past, but generally Dramful is seen as someone that a, a company that's you know selling you know good whiskies at a, you know a, a fair price. Obviously, the McEwen cask we paid a premium for them, and the product is exceptional. And I'm, I'm sure anyone that's tasted the whiskies uh, haven't heard anyone that's, that's said anything particularly negative about any of the whiskies, they're, they're all very, very high quality whiskies and ultimately once these casks are, are gone, they're gone. I mean, we've had some people, uh, you know, quite high up in the industry actually saying to us, you're selling those whiskies too cheap, you know, the, the McEwen ones. And yeah, I've, I got a lot of flag when we released the, the 13 year old Optimum. I saw it, yeah. Which yeah. was at the time, and I think it still is. It was the oldest optimal ever bottled, and it was the only one at that, that you know, anywhere near that age that had full term maturation in a in a very famous uh, chateau, the best chateau, uh, uh, and that, that makes sub term. So I'm, I'm not going to mention the name because Jimmy Hune will kill me. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's uh, yeah, it's it's an exceptional whiskey, um, and. Well, and we, we looked at some of some of them. Obviously, have been flipped, which yeah. is slightly disappointing. But um, on the other hand, it made us realise well, actually, we sold it for a fair price because the ones that were flipped were, were way more than three hundred and eighty pounds. So, you know, yeah. um, I, I know you said there that nobody's had a negative thing to say about it, but I, I'm going to jump in with a negative thing to say about the the Jimmy Coo cast. I bought three from yourself, the first three, and I was going to pop one open tonight, but I've forgotten it. So the negative thing is, it's not here. It's still at the shop. I was going to pop it open. Uh, yeah. I had some local deliveries to do, and I grabbed them and off, and I don't have it here. So I'm pretty gutted. Yeah. <laughs> but I will get it open, and we will, we will sample it. Well, the, um, the, pro the problem I have with that first release, um, it's, you've got to have a fine balance when, when you sell a whiskey. I usually try and keep a case back of each release for Dram Fool so that I can use them in tastings. But what, what I've learned um, from several of the people that I've been doing tastings for is why the hell are you doing a tasting using whiskies that are excellent but we can't buy them anymore because you sold them out two years ago? And I'm like, <laughs> That's actually not a bad point. Uh, so, uh, but, I'm, but I think in the past when I was doing whiskey tasting, I just didn't have the stock. I didn't have, you know, three or four casts coming out at once. It was one cask and then there was a gap of sort of six to eight weeks, sometimes 12 weeks. And then maybe I'd get a couple of bottlings 
uh, together and then there'd be another gap. But now they're coming uh, a bit more regularly. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm sort of in a position where I'm not keeping any stock back. I maybe keep one bottle back with the drum full bottles. Um, I, I've kept bottle number one of every single release. So I've got all for drum full has released 40 bottles. I've got bottle number one of, of each of those, but I don't have any other uh, bottles left um, apart from the ones that are still to sell. Um, so the McEwen stuff. What was the um, first bottle? We, we took we, we took the decision just to sell it all, and any any sort of we were one of the few companies, if not the only company, that actually uh, do miniatures of single casks. Um, this time, because of the, some of the feedback we got, not, I, I usually do a five cl and a ten cl bottle of drum full releases, but for this release, mm -hmm. people just seem to want a ten cl, so we didn't bother with a five. So we do 10 CL uh, samples of each of the, the, the bottlings. Uh, we also, for each release, we do a, 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 a triple pack of three 25 mil samples. So that's another way of tasting them. So I think we are maybe the only company that, that, that does that with, with, with every single release. So any kind of bottles that we had and we had, you know, anything left in them, they were used to make up the, the 25 mil sets. Um, so I've got none left, and um, I, I did the last tasting I did with uh, the first release bottles um, was actually last week with a, a, a German um, whiskey club, and I had a tear in my eye with each of the three drams. I thought this is <laughs> this is the last time because that was it. That's all I've got left. And I thought this is the last time. I'm going to taste these whiskies, <laughs> and you're you're kicking yourself, thinking maybe should have kept two or three bottles back. But um, the the demand was that high. We thought it's good to share this stuff. That you, you know yourself, Jim McEwen is an absolute legend in the industry, yeah. and the interest we've had has been phenomenal. We've had people all over the world emailing us asking, how do we get our hands on these bottles? Um, and I just feel. Um, having been a, a fan of Jim's for, you know, since he, he's, even before he was at Burukwadi, uh, when he was at Bomore, I knew about Jim and I'd, I'd, I'd heard stories about him with the, you know, the Japanese visitors that he used to get from Santori and I just thought this guy sounds like a real showman and, and he is. And, um, Certainly is, yeah. So I, I, I just think it's, it's you know, but there was one... Uh, very famous whiskey blogger based on the other side of the pond who if you excuse my language he said that's jim McEwen stuff don't fuck it up so <laughs> that put a bit of pressure you know the that put Just a bit a of on me and Colin. he basically <laughs> said these casks are once in a lifetime don't don't mess it up so um that, that put a, so how did that come about Sorry for you. And how how did it come about? How did you end up? Because he had the Cast Whisperer series, didn't he? They had the, yeah. the two uh, so, kind of understated. They weren't really advertised or pushed any. Certainly yeah. in the UK. Well, so. that's the thing. Um, what happened was, I mean, my, my drum food just now is a part time job for me. Um, I've, I've been working with drum food part time since twenty fifteen. Um, I, I, I got into whiskey when I was 23. Um, my my ex-wife, uh, well, my ex-father-in-law, fa ex he took me to the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, and I'd never enjoyed whiskey. It, you know, just had the usual when you're on a, a night out, someone would throw a bells at you or something, or a, a you know, a white Mackay or something, and. Um, I, I at the time was into real ales and um, Perno and Black Curtain. Uh, <laughs> 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 That's a big change. Typical student, typical student drink, yeah. Perno Swanky. <laughs> so, um, I, 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 like, I like the odd gin, and um, yeah, he took me to the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, and it, it was obviously the only one at the time was the one, the vaults in Leith. So if, if none of you have been there before, hopefully after COVID uh, go, goes completely well. It sounds like we're going to be able to get back in next week, I think. So yeah, um, yeah it's, it's, it's like an old gentleman. It's kind of modernized a bit now. 
But when I went there, it was really, it was all the leather sofas, the roaring fires, and it was a real kind of gentleman's club. Um, don't get me wrong, but there, there were women in there drinking as well, but it was a real, a real kind of old fashioned feel to it. And uh, I just, I, I just felt right out of my comfort zone. I didn't know what was going on. You had this numbering system on the bottles, I didn't know what it was. And, couldn't quite get my head around it, why they didn't, wouldn't just put the distillery name on it. And I was kind of like a, a rabbit in the headlights. But what he did was, I think with about six or seven whiskies, and there was two or three of them that I liked. And the ones that I liked, believe it or not, were the Lafroids and the Bomors. So that was my introduction to whiskey. And then from then on, in my early to mid-twenties, it was what's the peatiest, smokiest whiskey I can get my hands on. That's what I really like. So at the time, Lafroy had just introduced their um, cast strength, Lafroy, And that was like, you know, it was like fuel injected Lafroy at the time. That was a <laughs> person's description of it. And then obviously my tastes have, have changed since then. I mean, I still like peaty whiskies, but it's, it's maybe not necessarily my, my standard favorite style. Man. But um, yeah, so that was how I got into whiskey. And then uh, in 2006, 2000, sorry, 2005, um, some guys I was working with, um, I used to work down at the, the refinery and petrochemicals plant at Grangemouth. And there was a group of us who were into whiskey. We went to the Scottish Fall Whiskey Society maybe once a month, once every six weeks. One of the guys said, you know, Brook Laddie are selling casks of whiskey. Why don't we buy one between us? So there were seven of us. And at the time, Brook Laddie were selling a, a, a first fill bourbon barrel uh, of Brook Laddie spirit for £775. <laughs> Which, even then... £100 each. Yeah, right. exactly. It was, it was just over £110 each we paid. So that's not a huge huge leap of faith i mean okay you know if you even doubling that up you know to, with inflation you know paying yeah. a couple of hundred pounds to have a, a seventh share of a, a, a barrel you wouldn't even get a, a bottle for that now it's, no. exactly. well especially if you buy from me yeah <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah we, we did that and uh, I, I kind of organized it all and then we actually and this is crazy you, you're, you're not going to believe me when i tell you this when the whiskey was three years old, we, we knew it was coming up to be three years old. Uh, it was in May, and we managed to book uh, one of the Bowmore Distillery Cottages in May to, to go and visit our casks at turn three. And when we turned up, the Fesh Isla was on, which I'd never heard of before. None of the guys knew about it. And there was a festival of whiskey going on, and we just <laughs> walked up and didn't know anything about it. It was, it was mental. So. Spent a full day at Lager Rolling getting hammered, and then we're at Brook Laddie's open day. And then on the Monday, we went to Kalila, and then we went back to Brook Laddie to visit our cask, and they took us to see the cask, and they took a sample for us, etc., etc. And when we were there, there was a guy that worked in the still, who had a sign up in the still room saying casks for sale. So I approached him, because the guys were saying, why don't we buy another one? And he says, well, I've got this stuff called Port Charlotte. And... Port Charlotte hadn't been released then. No one knew what it was, right? And uh, we went, what is it? He says, oh, it's a PTL version of Brook uh, Laddie. He says, give me your address and I'll, I'll, I'll send you a sample in the post. So I gave him my address. The following week, I still haven't heard anything, so I phoned him up. And he says, oh, I'm really sorry. He says, just after you were with us, someone came in and bought all four casks off me. You know, without even tasting it, I'm like, all right, fine. He says, do you know anyone else that's got any cast for sale? And he says, well, I'll ask around. So I got an email from Ella Edgar, who was Jim McEwen's secretary, saying, I've got two casts at Port Charlotte. Um, one of them is a six-year-old first fill Sherry Hogshead, and the other one is a bourbon barrel, um, so same age. So she sent the samples, and... You know, she was looking for, at the time, what we thought was an exorbitant amount of money. She was looking for £5,000 for, for the, each cask. And in hindsight, <laughs> God, <laughs> today's prices, just you, you'd be lucky to get that three or four times that price. Yeah. 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 Um, so we, 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 managed to, we managed to talk her down. We, we, we bought the Sherry one for 4200 
which was a nice number because there was seven of us, so it was six hundred pound each. And we paid, we, we 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 sampled it at eight years old, and it was it was like Coca Cola this stuff. It was so intense, and you were just starting to get a slight hint of a, a sulfury, rubbery note, which I really don't like. So um, I emailed um, them back and said, can we just get this bottle? And um, I actually got an email back from Jim McEwen. I hadn't emailed him, but I got an email back from him saying, here's a tasting notes for your, your cast. He says, you need to bottle this now. And we're like, well, <laughs> that's, that's what we want you to do. So <laughs> they bottled, we bottled it. And um, the fall that this was in 2010. And now well, we bottled it in March 2010. And by this time, we had the, the Fish Isla bug. So we booked up in advance and we had a place booked for the, the long weekend. And, and we rocked up on Isla. And we took a couple of cases of whiskey with us, thinking we would just kind of share it out with people. And one of the guys that worked at the distillery and got wind of it, tasted the whiskey and said, this whiskey's fantastic, boys, you should be selling this. And we're going, well, can't really sell it because none of us have a license and et cetera, et cetera. But we had people approaching us and asking, can we see your bottle? And we showed them this bottle. We called it Port Skiba. Um, and guys were offering us like a hundred pound a bottle. And we said, well, we can't sell this. So what we did was we, we sold some of the bottles through Scotch whiskey auctions, because obviously they have the license. It's, it's them who's, you know, they're, they're, they're selling the, the bottle of whiskey to the public. So we did sell a few bottles, not very many, um, through, through them. And that made me kind of think, because um, this guy that wanted it was still like, kept in touch with me and sent me a few emails. And that made me think, um, if there was a way that if I, at any point in the future I had a little bit of money set aside where I could buy a couple of casks, if I got my premises license and my personal seller's license, that's something I could do as a hobby. And, you know, I could maybe get a couple of cases of whiskey and make a few thousand pounds. I, I suppose it. uh, uh, all I, to buy more and more casks. And, and, and that's, yeah. that's what happened with Drunk Fool. I suppose uh, an experience like that would be like winning 200 quid in your first scratch card. It's like, hey, this yeah. is easy. You know, yeah. th there is that danger that you, you can yeah. you buy into that kind of idea. You think this is going to be easy. And, and obviously it's not. You, you've probably found it's, it's not going to be quite as easy as that first experience. It's not easy. I, 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 people, people, I'm not, it's not hard either. <laughs> <But> it's, <laughs> it's, <laughs> no. I, think, I think it's the fact that it's, it's something you really, really enjoy that makes it not yeah. hard. It, it is actually hard work, but because you it's love doing it, it becomes a bit easier. The hard work is easier, if you know what I mean. It's a passion, but yeah. what I, I, I do things the hard way. Um, and I'm trying to get, I'm trying to make things a bit easier. I mean, I think the ordering system and the, you know, the, the shipping system I've got, it's too clunky. Um, there must be a, a smoother way of accepting all the orders and having all the paperwork printed out for you rather than have to do it all manually yourself. Maybe you can help yeah. me with that, Mike. <laughs> but, uh, More than happy to. It's, uh, and, I, and, and until last year, when I was working with Colin, I was doing this all myself. I was a one man mm -hmm. band. So, um, uh, what, I, what I did, the, <laughs> you will laugh at this, the, the, the first bottling I did, I wanted it to, I mean, obviously I'm not a signatory, I'm not a Gordon McPhail, I'm not a Cadden Heads, I can't afford, you know, super duper packaging. So, not yet. what I did know a little bit about was labels, and I had help from someone that knew a lot about labels, and I thought if I spend a lot of money on the labels so that they look good you know the quality of them it's got a good feel about it and then i also put the bottle in 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 some sort of packaging just to protect the label now at the time there were a lot of bottles using these really cheap flimsy you know rectangular boxes you know the plastic window in them that always falls out um, and you can get them for pen, you know 50 pence a pop if you buy them in bulk but I found a, a, a one of the big manufacturers um, who could make me 
um, a, a tall round bottle tube, which yeah. is the, the black tube that those tall round bottles fit. Yeah. And they said, well, we can actually do this cheap for you because we're doing a run for someone else and we could run off, you know, 500 of these tubes at the back end for you and it'll keep your cost down. The only problem is they're a millimetre too big diameter for your bottle. And I thought, how can I get around this? I thought, well, man, I could wrap up the bottle in black tissue paper just to go with the drum full colours, black and white. Yeah. So that's what I did. So I, I got these tubes. Um, the bottle was a little bit loose in, in, in the cylinder. So I bought these big sheets of, you know, tissue paper that they have in wine shops and maybe have in your shop. And you yep. roll the bottle up and wind the top and then stick it in the tube and it's nice and snug and it, it protects. And then I thought, that'd be a nice idea just to put a wee drum full label, just to, you know, just a, a sticker that you can print off in black and white on any product. Yep just to hold it all in place and put it in. And folk loved it. And they said, oh, it's, 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 it's got, even though it's an independent baller and you're a one-man band, it's got a nice kind of feel to it. You know, it's just yeah. a bit of effort going in there. So it, it was a rod for my own back. So <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have to do that. So, um, yeah, the, the bottles, the, the bottles for a while, there were some, there were some of the, the bottlings I was getting done um, I was actually labeling them myself. I was getting the labels and then hand, hand labeling them. I eventually got a machine to, to roll. Well, it's not a machine, it's like a, a manual kind of roller thing with a handle yeah. and you wind up. It's like a music box sort of thing. Expect <laughs> for your monkey to pop up. <laughs> uh, and that rolls a label on. Um, but now I've got my bo the, the bottles that I'm using. They put the labels on for me, which is good. But the black tubes. I'm still hand applying those labels because the label on the black tube is different for each release, and I'm still hand wrapping the bottle with. with I'm the just showing the guys the watching there the. Uh... So you so you have these six casks on every bottle, don't you? But every cask yeah. will have something slightly different about it. whether. So this is um, the High Parkland, um, which yeah. is a complete mystery to me where this actually comes from. Yeah, but, uh, really? if you look closer. <laughs> Uh, you'll see the wee Viking helmet and the axe on there, which is, and I didn't realize this until we had the uh, the taster with you six weeks ago. Every bottle has these tiny little details input into it, just little indicators of where that cask has come from, or or something about the whiskey itself, which is, I think, it's brilliant. It's, yeah. it's just it's just a wee bit of fun. I mean, what I mean, I you probably guessed. I don't take myself too seriously. Um, I'm a whiskey enthusiast. I love whiskey. I mean, I love buying whiskey and tasting other people's whiskey as well. Um, I've done a lot of tastings, as you know, recently. I've used I two tastings using uh, whiskeys from new distilleries, which was great. Some of the, some of the whiskeys we tasted were just astonishing for three years old. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the dram full cask sort of pile. Um, I didn't actually. I got. I, I did. My first release had a slightly different design. It was a, a lock and doll uh, blood tub, but all the subsequent releases have had that stack of barrels. Um, and I thought people asked me what's the significance of the color of the cask and the position of the cask, because with each bottle, um, sometimes the casks vary in colors, and something for that one. The yellow cask is yeah, at the top, top, sometimes on the bottom left, sometimes on the bottom right, or whatever, any of those six positions. Uh, people have asked me about the significance of that. So the colours, yellow is bourbon. I've done some orange or amber, which I use for grain, if it's been matured in bourbon. Um, red is generally, well, it's always sherry. Um, purple used for rum. And, and, and so far, they are the, they are the, um, the, the, the four colours that I've used. And the position of the cask, that's just random. That's just um, just to mess, mess people up. No, I just... <laughs> <laughs> so you could have had a whole Enigma so, code thing going on there. They're not exactly, exactly <laughs> thing, just to keep you on your toes. But yeah, so after, after I'd done four or five, I thought, how, how, how can I make... Oh, sorry, it was two. I tell a lie actually, um, because the Tobomori was a bit different. The 
Tobo Mori was my fourth bottle, and, and three casks had colours, and they were red, yellow, and blue, to to look like the the sea. The houses. Mori, the houses on Tobo Mori. Brilliant, fantastic. So, <laughs> like it. That's fantastic. I love it. So I, I, that that's what I did, and then the fifth one was a cast bridge. So I had a wee ghost and I spot some spiders webs on the cask because it's a lost distillery because it was shut down in 1983. So since then, I've always tried to not just have a plain stack of barrels with, with, with a colour. Um, I try and put something else on, like the, the Blair Athol uh, coming out soon has got a little otter on it because that's what they use on their flora and fauna bottle. It's not the yeah. same otter, obviously. <laughs> yeah. no, I wouldn't dare do that. <laughs> it's a different otter. It's a Shetland otter, actually. That's where I work. That's where my, my, my full time job is uh, up in Shetland. Um, so um, the, the the axe and the, the Viking hat was just a wee bit of a joke because the, the people, the Arcadians, they think they're real Vikings. No, it's the Shetlanders. They, they yeah, absolutely. Vikings, yeah. <laughs> uh, they, all, they, they still. <laughs> Half of them up there still think they're Norwegian, even though they speak with broad Scotch, uh, Scots, uh, Shetland accent. Yeah. They all think they're Norwegian. Um, and they, they I'm think, glad we don't have a big Arcadian contingency because we would have <laughs> loads of comments. Up <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, no, the, the, Orkney. I suppose. Um, I think. I think the, the Shetlanders look at Arcadians as plastic Vikings. You know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a a Shetland, of by the way. <laughs> Shet Shetland. I've been brainwashed. <laughs> We've got a couple of comments here from somebody you might know already. Sounds like you might know him, Callum Flanders. Oh, I know Callum, uh, yeah. So first of all, he's saying, he's just commented how much you love the David Beckham grain whiskey. Uh, I don't know if that's an inside joke. <laughs> oh, that, that's, that's the, that'll be the Hague, yeah. The um, Hague, yeah. Um. And secondly, he's asking what your next release is. What have you got lined up for us? Well, we've drum full. I've, I've got a, a Spirit of Space Side bottle, in which, which you've tasted or are maybe about to taste, which is a nine year old um, Glen Marvelous Oloroso cast. I'm showing you the label, but it's handwritten, so yeah. Yeah. That, that's what in my glass just now, actually. It's superb. So that sample that you've got was eight, but it's actually turned nine since, okay. since that sample, and uh, it, it's, it's been it's been bottled at ten years old. So um, I'm just waiting on the bottles to be delivered. Um, so is that the Oloroso one? That's the Oloroso one. Yeah, I've got a PX one, which yeah. I'm maybe going to sit on for another six months to a year, um, and I've also got. Uh, the, the Blair Athol that I was telling you about. So it's a 10 year old uh, cast strength Blair Athol from uh, a second fill uh, sherry butt. So it's got a hint of, of kind of red fruits in it. It's not, a, it's not, a, it's by no means a sherry butt, but it's a really nice drum. I've had some good feedback on it and it's, it's going to be much cheaper as well. And that's all I'll say. It's, it's going to be very good value for. Basically, 59.8 percent. So it's a bottle and a half and a ball. If you look at it, strength. Sounds, sounds fantastic. One of the best, one of the best drums I had last year from a from another independent bottle was a Blair Athol in a red wine. Um, just fantastic. So this one sounds really, really, uh, think, really think, interesting. Yeah. I think if Blair you're lucky, Athol, also, you might get a taste. If you're lucky. Yeah. If I'm lucky, if I'm good, yeah. <laughs> I think it's a very underrated uh, whiskey. The 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 flora and fauna Blair Athol, which malts.com had it on sale recently they were selling it for 35 quid i think yeah um, and you can usually pick it up for 40 45 pounds it's a stonker of a drum it's a really yeah. heavily sherried um uh, whiskey but without being rubbery or sulfury it's i, I was i was um very very impressed with it because it's, it's it's something i think it's a distillery i think a lot of people will overlook they pass by it on the way up to space side and they'll maybe stop in at it because it's got a good shop <laughs> but um, I think it's an underrated whiskey. Yeah. Uh, yeah we, we, have a, we, we have a similar issue with Aberdeenshire, uh, Bruce, as you maybe know that people tend to kind of st stick right up the middle of uh, space side and instead of coming across to the right. Yeah. Um, and and we're, we're kind of trying hard to, uh, to to promote the Aberdeenshire kind of whiskey. So are, are any of those some of the ones that you're looking at or interested in? Um, 
Well, I'm, I'm, my geography up that way isn't the best. Uh, <laughs> so I think you're, you're, you're Glen Geary's or yeah, Glen Glasses, perhaps, something well, like that? Well, Glen Glasses, yeah. Uh, or, uh, it's Sanine, is it called? The, yes, yeah, Sanine, Sand End, yeah, that's right. I've got yeah. to pronounce it. I, that's I, I right, know, absolutely, bang on, yeah. I only know this because I've, I've, I've got a, a, a friend who's an ex trollerman from Port Soy. Uh, who's, a, yeah. who's a, a massive collector of whiskey? Uh, yeah. he, he's, he's a huge Macallan collector, but uh, I, I've met him a few times and uh, he, he told me about that. So, yes, I've got a, a Glen Glasso, um, nice. hopefully bottled in the next few months. Um, have you ever heard of a, a gentleman called Ian Gray? He's, a, he's an artist. Um, he, he does paintings that kind of look like photographs and he does a lot of distillery themed paintings. So his artwork is in the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. It's also in um, Glen Glasgow's Visitor Centre. It's in Art Begg's Visitor Centre. He's, he's done a lot of commissions for distilleries. He's done stuff okay. for, uh, for Gladi as well. So he was paid uh, mm -hmm. for some of his work in casks rather than cash. Um, so I've, I've, I know him well. I've bought a few casks off him. So he sold me this Glen Glasso, um on the on the basis that he gets four cases um, out of it as well. So that's another thing I do. If any of you guys out there have got casks to sell, if I buy them off you, you will get as many bottles within reason as you wish from your cask as part of the deal. And that's something that I always offer when someone's selling a cask. Is, would you like some balls out of it? Even if it's just one, okay. or if it's 36 balls, um, we'll, we'll, we'll strike a deal. Because if I had a cask and I was selling it to someone to bottle, you know, and I'd had that cask for X amount of years, I'd want a few bottles out of it. Yeah. Wouldn't you? Yeah. So that, that, and, and a, lot of, a lot of people, it's, it's amazing. A lot of people that I've bought casks from said, so we, we, we chose you not because you had the highest offer, but because you were willing to do us bottles from the cask and I also offer them, yeah. you can either have the dram full label I'm going to put on or I'll get you something bespoke done or, or you produce I was going to ask, would you, would, would you do that the different way around, Bruce? So if we if we were to buy a cask off you, it says we'll let you keep a couple of, of bottles. Would you do it the other way around as well? Yeah, well, I've, I've, had, I've, I've, I've done that already. Um, the, the, the Rhythm and Booze project, I don't know if you've heard of them. Um, Two, two guys, uh, Philippe Schreiberg and Paul, I can't remember Paul's surname, um, they do, uh, they basically play kind, of, play kind of blues music and do whiskey tastings at the same time. Um, I got to know them on Isla because they were a fish Isla every year. So I did a bottle and I, I bottled a, a cask of Inver Gordon, Sherry Buck, 30, 31 year old Sherry Buck, which was a belt and um, 100 of them. Bottles were, were labeled their label on, and they, they sold them as, as their, their first bottling. So I'm going to do the same with them going forward. But yeah, if, if you guys are are interested, I, I can I can do something together, no problem at all. You've just inspired my next round, Bruce. Um, I'm I'm on a whole other. If you're interested, now you know, get it out in the open. I've got a, a I've got <laughs> a pair of 26 year old tomatins. Oh no! So I'm kind of my my. I made a bit of a. I'm not sure if it, I made a bit of a rash decision, or I just got or my bottle got mixed up because it was a verbal conversation I had with them. I don't have it in black and white anywhere, but I I was sure I told them just bought one of the casks and he's bought both of them. So, <laughs> uh, so I don't really want to release two 26 year old tomatoes at the same time. They're not sister casks. There's about five months between them. Um, right. One of them, one of them is light, fruity, tropical. The other one is light, fruity, and full of marijuana. Um, so, oh, nice. <laughs> I did not. Mate, we'll have that one. We'll have that one, yeah, mate. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> have, you tasted, have you ever tasted that in an older whiskey? I, I've picked it up in a few whiskeys. Um, the, 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 I don't know if they still do it. Ben Reich used to do a 21 year old called Authenticus. Oh, yeah, sure. yeah. Got that taste it, on a taste. He didn't get it on the nose, but he got on a taste. It was like someone smoking a really 
um, green grass joint, you know, not 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 harsh, like a, a really resiny, buddy, um, you know, like something you get in a, an Amsterdam coffee shop. Um, <laughs> and uh, it just, it's something, obviously, when you're a student at Edinburgh, you come across <laughs> these things in the, in the, in the, in the, you know, the, the 90s. But um, it's something, as soon as I tasted it, they kind it, of cast. took me back to being a, a student when I used to see in Merkison Avenue in Edinburgh. I was like, I'm, so I'm very, I'm very innocent, they, they, Bruce. They, they, they I, my dad was a gardener. I thought it was uh, the smell of burnt leaves. Um, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> yeah. Did it give you a hankering for a perno in black? <laughs> yeah, well, no, 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 really. I don't know if I could face one of those these days. Um, I used to, it's funny, I used to drink perno just with water in it, which is a, a great, uh, it's a great lead into talking about non chill filtration, isn't it? Um, oh, yes. well, yeah, yeah, the, with the colour, yeah. When, when, you, when you use the, the pastis or, or the perno kind of example, people that clicks with them, they understand what it's all about, man. Um, exactly. So, exactly. Uh, it's, a yeah. good, it's a good example to use when people wonder why whiskey yeah. is, chill, is, is better non chill film. We've, uh, we've got a, a comment from Tim uh, here. Who's... All right. Uh, uh, it's from. Uh, oh. I've never, I've never been able to taste what was in the cask before, other than casks I've refilled myself. Uh, well, not physically, but I've asked for it to be done. So one of the kind of experiments I did, and I, 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 I mean, I don't have the luxury of being able to lay down casks for years and years and years. I've got basically got to buy casks and turn them around pretty quickly. I'm now in a position where there's a little bit more money coming in that some of the casks I'm buying now are, are kind of longer term. I'm all, also looking at starting up a, a cask ownership uh, club as well with we, Colin. Uh, you'll see Drumfield Cask Management on our website. So we're looking at selling casks as 10% yeah, shares, definitely. but it's, it, we're not selling them as an investment because there's a lot of people out there who say, oh, you know, we're selling whiskey, but it's not an investment, but everyone knows that's what, it's, that's what they're selling it as they're selling a whole cask. So what we're going to do is a wee bit different. We're going to sell shares of casks, so 10% of a cask, and then we'll offer you, um, you know, every year we, we draw samples from the cask. We will, we will taste it, get, write our evaluation, taste notes, etc., and send that out with a sample to the, the guy who's got, the person who's got 10% share the cask and then they can taste this. So that'll happen every year. So you can get a, an understanding of the, the evolution of the cask. And we'll also stipulate, I mean, we can't say, you know, we're selling this five-year-old cask and we're going to keep it until we think it's ready. We, we'll, When we taste the cask originally, when we sell the share that we'll say, right, this is going to be bottled in five years' time when it hits 10 years old, regardless, unless it goes tits up. You know, unless there's some bad off notes in it and we feel we need to re rack it for you or whatever, um, this is when it's going to be bought. Because the only person I've ever seen do that was um, Raymond Armstrong uh, when he was at Bladnock and he, he ran the Bladnock Forum. He actually sold shares, 10% shares in uh, Margadale, which is uh, a peated Bonnerhaven. And but having, to my knowledge, I've never released mm -hmm. a Margadale, they never used the name. Um, but the cask were sold as Margadale. I mean, I actually saw some of the casks in the warehouse that Margadale stamped on them. Um, and he sold 10% shares and he basically said to people, this is going to be bottled at 10 years old, no arguments, no fighting, uh, this is it. So when you sign up to your 10% of that cask, it's going to be bottled then. Unfortunately, um, Bladnock went in the receivership because <laughs> Raymond and his brother fell out. But one of the guys uh, that owned the 10% share in the cast that I had a 10% share uh, knew Martin Armstrong very well and basically managed to, with Martin's uh, help, to get that cask out. We got it away because Ernest and Young saw it as being part of Bladnock and with the producer all the documentation saying, well, actually, no, it's owned by these 10 people who have got nothing to do with Bladnock. They got it out and we bottled it and it was a fantastic whiskey. So I thought, that's a great model, but we'll improve it 
by doing the sampling bit as well, so people can taste the cask as it develops over the years. So that's something I'm looking at doing. Um, the sounds great, yeah. Yeah, going back to the original question, sorry, I, I digressed a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I, I did. Uh, well, I, <laughs> I, I managed to get my hands on some Lagavulin spirit, which was already. My memory serves me. It was already eight or nine years old, a long time ago, and my memory is shocking. And um, some of it, I, I, I re racked, sorry, it was in sherry, and I re racked a bit of it into a small sherry octave, first fill sherry octave or fresh sherry octave. Um, and I bottled it after, uh, it had about seven or eight months in there, if I remember rightly. And it was fantastic. And it was sitting at Whiskey Broker in Crete and Martin Armstrong actually sent me an email saying, that's a great wee cask, you know, you should put something else in it. So at the time, I just bought a Gurfin uh, Hogshead and um, I thought, well, why don't I put some of that spirit into there? So that's what I did, because I thought, I'll be quite interested in having Gurfin that's, that's been matured in an ex lag of rolling Oloroso, Hogs, uh, Oloroso um, octave a little bit different. So what I did was, when that had been left for a year, it was turned 11 years old, I bottled that. Um, another portion of the Gervin cask was put back in to the, 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 the lag of rolling octave, and then the rest of it, what was left in, in the, in the Gervin cask was, was bottled. So it was basically bottled on the same day as the lag of rolling or the ex lag of ruling spirit. So basically you could see taste the difference. You had two whiskies that were originally they were from the same cast, but a portion had been taken out and put into this octave for a year. And the difference was quite marked. I mean don't we all you know it was only very, very slightly darker. But the taste profile it was different. You could pick out fruit from the sherry and you could pick out a wisp of smoke. And a Gervin grain. So yeah. I haven't had any smoky uh, Gervins before, but this one was slightly smoky. Unfortunately, <laughs> the yield wasn't that great because it was only a wee octave. I think I've only got about 62 balls out of it, so it didn't go very far, but it was interesting. So I've done that. The other thing I did was I had some uh, Kalila bulk spirit. And what I mean by bulk is it was sold to me in a, in a plastic IBC. Uh, for those of you who don't know what that is, it's a, a meter square cube of plastic, industrial bulk container, holds a thousand liters, food grade plastic. Um, a lot of distilleries, if they have excess spirit or they're waiting on cast coming in or whatever, they, they excuse me, <coughs> <coughs> um, hopefully that's not the COVID injection having its effect. But... <coughs> <laughs> I think I'm done. I, I noticed you haven't had a wee whiskey yet, <laughs> Bruce. That's probably that's maybe you, you're on that um that diet stuff tonight, are you? The H2O. I do have a whiskey. I think that's what I need. <coughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was <coughs> bloody hell. You need to give me a minute. Yeah, no worries. I'm welling up talking about this. <laughs> I'll, I'll pop you on mute just a second, Bruce. Give me a wave when you're ready to go. Uh, so Russell, what are you thinking uh, well, tonight? For, for, well, that's just what you say. Um, a, Bruce has kind of a, basically in, influenced every single drink I've had. So, well, apart from the first ones, um, but I decided to work away with some um, some samples I got from a, a grain tasting it with Spirit Embassy a while ago, and I never ever I never ever drank them. And they were sitting there, so I started with the Dumbarton, one of the South Clyde, and of course the uh, Bruce then mentioned in for Gordon. So that's my next one. Mm-hmm. And you're just talking about Gervin, so I've got one of them lined up for after that as well. So, <laughs> so I'm, like just wait, I'm just, just <laughs> waiting for you to name the last one I've got here, and then that's the. Oh, that's there can't the be very many grains left for you. Because I'm just <laughs> well, there's only there's, there's probably <laughs> one left, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I was just about to say that I, I, I bought, it was actually 750 litres of 10 year old Kalila. Kalila, yeah. So some of it went into uh, a fresh fill, all also hogs head. Another bit went into a first fill, uh, sorry, a fresh fill, PX Hogshead, 
Uh, the rest of it went into a quarter cask, which I was subsequently persuaded to sell on. Uh, a gentleman approached me desperate for some Kalila, so I sold that on. Um, and then the rest of it was bottled as a 10 year old, which was a, a really nice whiskey. <coughs> when I eventually bottled all the Kalilas from the um, all also in PX uh, hogsheads, I just bought, I, I just purchased two 14 year old high parklands, which you were drinking earlier. Like. Yeah. Um, and I thought they were right. So you may get a wee drop of that as well. They were, they were sister casks. The, the flavour, I mean, I, I spent ages trying to work out which one was better than the other, and I couldn't. So I just picked one uh, randomly to bottle, and I thought, what I'm going to do with the other one is I'm going to stick it in um, the Oloroso, the X Kalila Oloroso cask. So that's where that is just now. So it's been there for about, it's been there for about a year, I think. So it's an ex Kalila, um, fresh all also cast. I mean, the Kalila was only in it for a total of about 20 months. I, I bottled it in two portions. So it was still a very active cask. So I'm kind of open, um, and this is just not cheating, but it's, it's just adding something. I'm wondering, because the Kalilas were quite smoky. Yeah. Um, as someone said that when I bottled the, the, the Kalila that hadn't been uh, re, re racked, it just comes straight out of plastic. <laughs> uh, um, a lot of people said that's a smoky bastard of a Kalila. So uh, it, was, it was good spirit, it went, went down well. Yeah. So I'm kind of hoping that that cask will add a little bit of smoke to that Highland part. And that Highland part, I'm sure you agree, Mike, it does have a wee thread. Of, smoke it's, it. it's there but just and I, I when i first Smoke poured it when we came in uh i was i was like, oh, i've done this the wrong way around i thought i should have had the high parkland last because you'll be that smoke influence that we expect but i thought as soon as i taste it i said i think i'm gonna be all right here it, it's you know if i was to then go to another bourbon i think fair enough but with the, the spiciness of the sherry cast i'm having i think we're i i, I, I got away with that one but uh, yeah there, there certainly is just that little kind of it's I, I, I would be loath to call it smoke it's because because it's not strong enough to be smoke for me i don't oh, think it's, it's just it's just a wee it's just a wee wisp isn't it so, yeah yeah it's, it's like somebody's it's smoking it's outside and you're just getting whisked through the window or something like that is uh, we'll, we'll this. Case, case <laughs> note, i once read at the scotch malt whiskey society it was like a gossamer thin thread of smoke <laughs> i like that <laughs> i like that so yeah, it's it's got a wee bit, but that is a what I would call an old styley, an old styley uh, Highland Park. That's the sort of stuff that the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society used to bottle 15, 20 years ago. Uh, yeah. Bourbon Highland Parks, and I think they're great. And I'm not just saying that because I've bottled it. I, I mean, <laughs> I haven't, all I've done is bottled it. I haven't produced it. I've just been lucky enough to be offered it, bought it blind. Yeah. As I gamble, because it's the first oh, time I've been offered, uh, you know, that particular distillery. And uh, when I got the two samples through, I was expecting the worst. I thought these are going to be tired. You know, I'm, I'm a great believer in that you make your own luck, Bruce. And I, 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 I think there's there's something about kind of being in the right place, the right time, making the right decisions and stuff like that. And and the way you talk about thinking about what we're going to do with this, what we're going to do with that, it, it just sounds like you're living the dream. I mean, does yeah. does it does it feel like that? It does, it does, but um, I, I shouldn't say but, but I can't help myself. I, I, I would like to move into it full time, but I'm just a bit, the problem I've got just now is I've had a lot of very loyal customers who, I've got guys who have been there from day one who have bought every single release that I've done. I've got a guy who takes three bottles of everything that I do um, I've got guys that started on about the release six and it's getting to the stage where I had three casks I was going to release at once and one, one of them was a, a 25 year old malt can heel um, which is a yeah. under still that I'm not allowed to name um, and the other one was a, a 
44 year old cast bridge and in the high parkland and I, I just thought I can't release all three of these whiskies at the same time because my customers are going to say you're the new Baruch Laddie because Baruch Laddie were like this 15 years ago they were releasing a, a new whiskey every time the wind changed direction yeah and people like myself started collecting the Baruch Laddie um when they first started releasing stuff you know you know in 2001 and after a couple of years i just couldn't keep up with that i didn't have the money to to, to buy every release that they had and, and i don't want to be like that but i'm gonna have to be like that at some stage otherwise i, I can't do this full time so what i'm trying to do is to do a few different ranges so that's why we've done the jim McCune signature collection it's a separate range from the drum full kind of core ballads but i'm now going to do um some i'm, I'm going to try and do another range i've got another thing up my sleeve um so i'm going to try and release more but in different ranges so that people don't feel that the range they're buying yeah, they can they can still buy all those bottles and they don't have to buy all the bottles that's yeah. that, that's what i'm going to try and do for a second then i thought you were going to say you're going to take out a gin <laughs> or a rum liqueur yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> well um <laughs> you, don't, you, know, you are right you are <laughs> uh, well watch this space <laughs> <laughs> okay. I've, 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 been, I've been working closely with a guy who developed botanist gin so say no more um oh, well cool. indeed yeah absolutely <laughs> indeed you have <laughs> and I've, 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 well, the other thing we've done is um, the three. Let me get this right. The three wine casks from the first release, and the cask that is going to be our next Jim McCune release, which is the, the the Journey's End bottle, which is kind of separate from the Jim McCune signature collection, but it's one of Jim's casks, and it's basically to to mark his retirement because. Yes, he, he, he says to he's told me many times I've had more comebacks than Frank Sinatra. Yeah. This <laughs> like he really is retiring, and I, I think he is. In, in all seriousness, if, if any of you have been on the tastings with Jim and compared it to the tastings he did maybe five years ago, there's a big difference. In, 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 in him. So I think he is retiring this time. He did retire from Brewer Wadi and then went straight to Ardna Hall. And then he's done stuff at Byron Bay. He's done stuff with a distillery in South Africa. Mm -hmm. He's done all sorts of consultation work. So he's never really retired, but I think this time he will. So sorry, I, I digress there. That, that cast that we're doing for his, his retirement is a, a Banyol cast, which is something I wasn't really sure what it was. So I looked it up. I thought I knew a bit about wine. But Banyol is a red wine, a red grape, sorry, dessert wine. So it's, it's classed up, it's just, it's just like Sauterne, but instead of using white grapes, they use, they use red grapes. Okay. So it's from a very specific region. Um, it's added, it's actually got a peachy color, the spirit, which is interesting. So that cask, along with the three wine casks, and a bourbon Port Charlotte, and a bourbon Optimal cask, have been sent somewhere to get filled up with Kalila. So nice. they're yeah, yeah. gonna have we're gonna have Kalila um that's been part matured at Bourbon Hogsheads, then transferred into um an ex Jim McEwen cask. So it'll be really interesting to see. Yeah. Obviously I'm I'm interested in what the wine casts are, are very active <clears throat> and I'm thinking that the, the Optimal and Paul Charlotte might do something with it with the Kalila as well. So that's one thing we're doing. Um, the other thing I'm, I'm, uh, is, is in the pipeline is I'm just about to acquire an empty uh, Port Charlotte and Octomore bourbon barrel. And I thought, wouldn't it be nice, rather than to fill that with whiskey, to fill them with beer? So that's um, something I'm thinking about. I know. I think Isla Ales have done an Octomore Ale, but I think that used the Octomore Barley. I don't think it was, I might be wrong here, but I don't think it was matured in an ex Octomore cask. So that's something that we're looking at, just just something different. Yeah. See what happens, yeah, because yeah. I, I think, um, 
was it Innocent Gun just released a Lefroy one or something like that? Yeah. I think it's quite so, a few of these, which is is great. It's interesting. I think it's it's maybe a step for for beer drinkers to get into whiskey as well. Yeah. Find yeah. a pairing. Well, it, it, it's funny because a lot of the tastings that I do, obviously the, there's a formal aspect of it where I try and stay sober, which I usually fail miserably. <laughs> But, and then yeah. after, um, <laughs> all the, everyone kind of signs off after the 90 minutes and there's a hardcore bunch of guys on at the end not just guys there's girls as well um, and generally the subject comes around to beer uh, you'd be surprised uh, it does come around to beer because people are usually drinking a beer with a whiskey oh what's that you're drinking they'll see a can of brew dog or a yeah, kind of yeah. whatever gamma ray or something, and uh, so that's what made that's what Colin and I was. It was oh, I'm not gonna lie here, it was Colin's idea. Why don't we, if, if rather than fill some of these casks for whiskey, why don't we put some um, some beer in and see what happens? So we've got a brewery in mind, um, and um, we're gonna speak to them um, and, and, and see what happens. So, so guess, sounds like, fantastic, sounds good, yeah, yeah. Um, so who did you know, who who's what market is your um most ardent? You know, who who are these guys that you're saying are buying every? Are they, are they UK based? Are they because I know so, Germany? Uh, which what what country or what what's your biggest market or what or what's your biggest growing market? I don't, I don't have a base market. Um, no, I've got three brand ambassadors: one in Germany, one in USA, and one in Singapore, and they are taking an allocation of each of the releases. Um, the rest of it, I mean, I, I ship worldwide with DHL, so I can ship to, to Norway. Um, I can ship... Yep, Charlie. Uh, I used to, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought she'd been on the wrong chat when she, she came on and said, good evening, fine gentlemen. I thought, Charlie, you're in the wrong chat here. <laughs> you forgot who we are, Charlie. <laughs> 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 I, can, I, can, I, can, I can ship to anywhere in the world now, apart from France, Poland, Sweden and Italy. Yeah, they've gone crazy, haven't they? Uh, and, and that's all because of Brexit. And those three, those four countries have gone against the grain of the other EU countries and they're just not accepting. Well, Poland, you can send up to a litre person to person. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can't send it as Drum Fool, I can send it as Bruce Farker. Um, I've <clears throat> just tested that out recently, so I don't know I don't know what's gonna happen. I've okay. had so many shipments, I've filled out all the paperwork correctly to Germany, and it's just a lottery whether whether I guess returned to you or not. Um, you know, seventy five percent of them get through. Some of them go through in a few days, some of them take three weeks, and then another twenty five percent you just get an email saying it's been returned to you. Yeah, um, and, and it's just it's it's no use for a, you'll be the same, Mike. For a, you know, I can sympathise. I'm sure you can sympathise. He's a small company. Yeah, um, um, it was so easy to ship to Europe. You didn't need, we, you didn't need any paperwork. Now you've got to fill out reams of customs paper. If you were talking about it before we came on 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 air, that a tasting set with six different whiskies. You know, they're only 25 more measures, but you've to you've to basically detail the, the, the volume and, and strength yeah. of each of those whiskies on your customs documentation, which all takes time. I think that you know, as somebody like yourself who is, like you say, you don't have uh, a kind of focus market. You're doing our focus market is certainly local Scotland, UK, uh, and then Europe. We would we're not doing Europe every day, but you must be. Yeah. Sending parcels out to, to Europe almost well, daily, and that must take up so much time at the moment. Yeah, well, I mean, the, 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 the John McEwen stuff has really opened up the States for us. Yeah. Our, our guy in the States has taken a lot, but there's also people kind of bypassing him and, and ordering uh, direct, um, which we need to we need to address going forward. But, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm shipping stuff regularly to, to, to Germany, I must admit, probably one of my biggest markets before Brexit was Sweden. Um, I've now got, hopefully, a route into Sweden uh, via Germany. 
So I need to send to Germany first and then they ship to, to Sweden and that means I'll be able to access France, Poland and Italy as well. Um, but that, that's a wee bit away from being sorted out. But obviously it's just going to increase the cost of my whiskey in these countries, but at least they can get them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <coughs> Charlie's asking there if you need a brand ambassador in Norway. Norway. She, she's yep. more than happy yeah. to. Well, I, I think <laughs> I've already got one. I think, I think she's already there. <laughs> um, yeah, Charlie, it's well, you. Yeah. If you. If you do, if you're good at something, never do it for free. That's why I heard Charlie. Well, indeed. <laughs> but um, yeah. Oh, you um, never said that to me, mate. Right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm gonna be good, good at it first. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Okay. That's a mistake I'm making. <laughs> but, to answer your question, I, I, a, a lot of my stuff does go local and in the UK, uh, mm -hmm. which is, and to be honest, um, I prefer it that way, because as you know, it's so easy to ship in the UK, um, everywhere else now, I mean, EU used to be just like shipping to, to the UK, so it was great, um, but it's just, it's just turned, it's just turned upside down since Brexit, so I don't know if, if they'll relax the rules as, as time goes I know, on. You know, when it came in, Germany was, was a nightmare for that. You know, it was backlogged. Uh, but they, they've, they've really sorted it now, which is good. And I think you know, for us to get the paperwork key right, it, it was a, a struggle to start with. Yeah. But, uh, you know, a lot of these countries have... That's the thing. It was, it was, and this, is, this is why the, the, the one or two of my customers in Sweden who were really upset with me personally, basically saying, you haven't prepared for Brexit. I said, well, how could I have? Because no one knew what was going to happen. <laughs> one of the biggest companies in the world. I was asking yeah. the DHL rep, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? We don't know. We'll find out on January the 1st. And mm. that was the answer I got. And I was telling this guy in Sweden, and he, he just didn't believe me. And he says, this is, this is all your fault. You should have had something in place. But <laughs> yeah. So, so the Azure has something in place, do they? You know, they, none of these companies. No good you. Yeah. Without without getting into politics, the 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 three lead people who were actually uh, lobbying for Brexit all resigned after they actually won. After they actually won, so nobody was actually prepared for it. If that's uh, yeah. the way we're looking at. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. It was, I, I, the, the the thing that I found funny, um, my, my, my DHL guy actually told me. What's the issue with Germany? And he says, Well, you wouldn't believe this. Bruce. He says, What we are being told is they weren't prepared for Brexit. They didn't they didn't comprehend how much additional paperwork their customs department would have to deal with. Yeah. And they never they never increased the number of customs officers that they had working for them. So they were caught cold. And that's why now they're starting to catch up because they've got more people working in customs doing all this paperwork. Obviously it's taking time to employ these people and get them trained up, etc. Yeah. I thought it was very, very un German like, not being prepared. <laughs> not being prepared for yeah. anything, absolutely. Yeah. It felt can, from can, us that they were being too too efficient, too specific. Yeah. Uh, it, it was just caught and from our point of view, that was it kept asking questions that we've given you all that. And then they asked the customer, and so we had to send the details to the customer. And it was like, "Come yeah. on, guys, just let's go." So, yeah. So, Bruce, just a kind of uh, another quick question. Well, that's maybe it's not a quick question, but just on the back of that, I mean, I guess we've been stymied a little bit in terms of the industry with Brexit, with the U.S. tariffs that were along there for a while, COVID. But at the same time, whiskey's booming just now. I mean, how how do you see things progressing? What's your feeling for how things are going yeah. to progress? I'll, I'll be honest, uh, when, when COVID kind of kicked in, I just had, when the lockdown kicked in, I just had four casks bottled and I was sitting in my old facility because I've recently moved with basically four, four casks of whiskey and cases all around me, you know, float to see when I could hardly move, thinking absolutely, you know, worried, worried sick and how am I going to sell this stuff? because everyone was being followed. I just thought no one's going to want to buy this sort of whiskey because I mean, I had a, you know, a, a, a 250 pound malt can heel and locking down and stuff like that. And I was thinking what's going to happen. And 
as soon as I put an email out, I had folk kicking my door in for it. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. And uh, when I, anything that I put on the website was gone in a matter of hours, and I, I couldn't keep up with it. And then it, I got to the stage where uh, all that stuff was sold, but all the other casks I had that I'd been telling people about, all the warehouses were shut. They'd, they'd, they'd followed all their guys, and I just couldn't access any of my casks. So for about four months, I, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't sell anything because I couldn't get the casks out. So that was a problem. But yeah, the, 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 I think whiskey is going to keep is going to keep keep expanding. Maybe not, you know, exponentially. But I think there's a there's a, a huge interest in single malt. There seems to be a massive interest in you know single casks, independent bottlers, uh, new distilleries. Yeah. Obviously, you've got your cult distilleries like your Ardbegs, your you know, Spring Blanks, McAllen's, who are always going to have a following. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, McAllen don't have to try to sell our stuff. Would you class McAllen as a cult distillery? I'm not so sure. Well, no. <laughs> you know I mean? You're almost yeah. right. Yeah. As in, <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But, um, and, and stuff, you look at Daft Mill, Daft Mill just flies, you know, it's just, it yeah. sells it in literally seconds. Um, I was speaking to Alex Bruce uh, Delphi yesterday because they, they do some unbottling. And they, they released a, a, a single cask out in the market at uh, Royal Wild Whiskies, and it, it sold out in a matter of minutes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, oh, it's, it's just unreal. it's just so I think I think the the, 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 the kind of niche stuff is, is just going to keep gathering more momentum and more interest, which is good for me because that's what I'm. Yeah, yeah, I, absolutely. Yeah, I think we just touched on it just there with with whiskey. And it, it was, you know, in the last 12 months, the body blows with the 25% the tariff on the US, Brexit, and then the COVID. You know, that's three mass. And there's an article I read just at the start, at the end of last year, saying that sales are down 25% because of these three. And I'm thinking, no other industry in the world would, would you know, 25% is. It's not That's much nothing, to consider. It's nothing but, given those three body blows, massive yeah. global yeah. body blows. Yeah, it's it's almost yeah. like Rocky uh, in Rocky Four when Drago's pounding him, he gets up and wins. It's like you know, we'll we'll, we'll get there. We're, we're taking a few oh. body blows, but we'll get there. And I think it shows you how, how well, booming the I'm, I'm not belittling what's happened to this country in any way with COVID. It's had a, a horrendous impact on people. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely, yeah. personally, yeah, indeed. And mm -hmm. some of the industries have been destroyed, but yeah, I, I can't believe, you know, this part-time job that I've got, if anything, it, it's it's flourished slightly. And I, I don't mean to sound, you know, I don't mean to sound dismissive or, 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 or you know, I don't, I don't want to cause anyone any offence because obviously COVID has affected everyone. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I know people that have passed away and it's affected all our lives, but the, the, the sales of whiskey, if anything, for me have increased. And then the other thing that's really kicked off is exactly what we're doing just now. Because you wouldn't have had stuff. Yeah. These sort of events didn't really happen that often before COVID. And certainly whiskey tastings online didn't. I, oh. I, I wasn't aware of any whiskey tasting that had been carried yeah. out online until, you know, sorry, early March, April last yeah. year. And, uh, yeah. I've been, I, I think if anything, it'd be like a Facebook Live, one yeah. person on you know, talking about it, and people yeah. comment on it, and, and yeah, that's right. how we started. Yeah. Um, and then everyone said, "We're jealous. Why are you drinking? And we're not." Also, <laughs> that was what happened. Well, it was you. It was you, mate. You, you were, uh, you were tasting a, a release from a distillery, and everybody was like, well, "Why can't we? Why can't we taste yeah. that?" Yeah, so yeah. That's, that was why you kind of did it. Yeah, but I think you're absolutely right, Bruce. The, the whole thing about the sharing, the whole thing about the, the whiskey is all about sharing. It's all about sharing experience. And and I think we were in a we were in a kind of wee bubble of, of fellow whiskey drinkers that that were doing that and were you know falling upon festivals and you know falling maybe falling in a pub that was a whiskey bar that we didn't know and then eventually getting into it. But this whole COVID experience has allowed us to share that even further. And if anything else, you're right about not disrespecting anybody, but it's been a way of actually giving people a bit of a release, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. something to kind of look forward to. In, in, in the kind of hard times, and yes. you know, I think that'll continue. Some people see it as 
it's like a, a social club almost. Yeah. Like yeah. Because you 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 be the same, Mike, with the tastings you do. There's a, a core kind of group of regulars. Yeah. Yeah. They go to most of your tastings, and that's the same with me. And the guys love it. They they love coming on. There's there's a bit of banter. I mean, my my tastings are always fairly informal. Um, I'll, I'll try and stick stick to the structure of tasting the six whiskeys. <laughs> It's people, not going to happen, is it? Yeah, <laughs> but in and that, and it's, I've never had to kick anyone out. It's never, it's never got that unruly. Um, <laughs> no one's ever been that offensive. But then at the end, there's a bit of a chat, and there's kind of the, the hardcore core group of people at the end who sit, and some of them will chat till two, three in the morning. Yeah. Sign off and I sign someone else as the host so I can go to my bed. Um, I, I used to do that. I, I, but, you know, the, when we started it, it was, uh, and, and Charlie, who is one of our, our regulars uh, um, is just in the school there. She was at one of our first tastings when we had Robin Lang uh, yeah. come in and do some songs. It's, it's, uh, and I remember walking home. Because this was when I did it at the shop yeah, yeah. before I came home. And I said, like, walking home, it would be half past two in the morning. It's lashing rain. And I, I'm still in the chat because I converted it out to my phone. I'm walking home in the chat. I said, like, what is going on? Yeah. But we did it for so long. Um, and then, then it just grew. It grew as it's, it's physically impossible to do that every night. It, it, it's a case of that yeah. like, you're the host now. I need to go. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I could I could easily do a tasting once a week online with yeah. the amount, amount of customers and followers I've got, but I, I just can't physically do it because mm -hmm. you know it, it came to the point where I was doing one bottle tastings, so I was, <laughs> I was selling twenty seven sets, you know, and one one for myself, obviously. But then I had so many people disappointed that they missed out, but I started doing two bottle tastings. And I can yeah. see going forward and need to up that to three. So all of a sudden, you, you know, you, you're going from filling, uh, you know, 28 times six, whatever that is, 140, 100, 168, to over 300, to maybe nearly 500 tubes every week and shipping them out. And it's, it's very time consuming doing it. Um, and I don't, honestly make a i mean i make a little bit of profit on the tastings for my time that's it um but i i don't want to be ripping people off and charging them exorbitant amounts of money for kits mm. in fact one of the things i've done recently which is brilliant um i don't know if you've heard of have you heard of the term buck she before yes buck, yeah 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 so <laughs> it's a uh, it's um, you used to, oh, when I used to work at grangeburg the guys used to say everything was buck she so it's free rhyming slang for, for free. So I did, uh, uh, I had a couple of guys that were on my tastes and saying, you know, we would, you know, we would give you a ball to use them on your tastes. And I just thought, oh, wait a minute, if I can get five guys plus me put a free ball and then I can do a tasting for basically just cover the cost of the kits and the shipping and, and, and my time making it up and, and allowing those guys to maybe get their, their, the value of their bottles worth in future tastings. So if they, yeah. You know, send me a bottle that's worth, you know, ninety quid or something. And they'll maybe get their own taste and plus another three for free. So that, that's what I started. I've, I've done that. So I was able to sell those tastings for fifteen pound a pop. So we call it a box sheet tastings. I've done two. Um, really? Another. I've got another one in the pipeline, and it's just people. It's just people uh, who've been kind enough <laughs> to send me bottles. And some of the one of the bottles I've got for the next box sheet tasting. Is a an old style dumpy Highland Park ball. Um, you know, oh, okay, yeah. One with the sun, the sunrise on it, and all that. Yeah, yeah. Um, So we've got that. I've got, an, I believe it or not, an imperial. <laughs> so these are going to be in a fifteen. Oh, pound that's not. That's not my fifth one. That's not your fifth one. No, it? it's not. <laughs> 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 so uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's great. I, I, the, the biggest taste in that, well, not not to, at the time last year, um, I, I, the year before, I'd organised the first indie whiskey fish isla, and it was the first independent bottlers festival. You know, that had been given the blessing of the, the fish committee. And obviously, last year it couldn't happen, so I, it was just at the last minute. I'd done an online taste and I just thought, why don't we do a virtual Indie Whiskey Face Isla? So the Face Committee agreed to it and I managed to get 
uh, 10 um, independent ballers who'd been at the festival before to be interested in it. So they sent me their whiskey and I had to make up literally <laughs> thousands of tubes of whiskey. At the time, I was, I was just using a pour. I actually gave myself tennis elbow. No. Two to six months to recover from it, from this <laughs> thousands of them all in test tube racks. It was a nightmare. Um, so uh, yeah, it was it was hard going, but I did the tasting, and um, we're sitting on this tasting. We had Sam Simmons from Martin Brands. We had uh, um, I think who else is on it? Uh, uh, Gregor Hanna from Lady of the Glen. Yeah. It was right. Caroline from uh, the the the. the, the, the Scotch whiskey company. There was a, it was great, and we were sitting and there was people asking questions. There was a guy sitting in the pitch black in Kuala Lumpur. Um, there was a guy sitting in Colorado with his shorts and t-shirt on, wrapped around shades, sitting out in the sunshine. <laughs> there was a guy in Sydney, Australia. Uh, there was another guy in South Africa. There was a gentleman up wow. in Finland. There was guys in Shetland. There was guys on Iowa. There was guys down in Cornwall, and we're all sitting on this tasting, and I just was like, I can't believe this is happening. And if you told me even six months before, yeah. I'd be hosting a whiskey tasting online, um, where you'd have 90 people from all over the world chipping in and talking about whiskey, you think, that's not going to work. How can yeah. that work? It's not the same as going to the pub. Because I was doing tastings in... Uh, pubs and, 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 and uh, the kind of clubs sort of every sort of three to four weeks and, and then obviously with COVID it stopped and I did this I just thought when when I first thought about it I thought hey, it's not going to work it's going to be rubbish but it's great yeah and it saves it, you it, 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 saves, it saves you you know I used to go to Tyson's in Edinburgh you know a dark November night you'd have to get a taxi down to the train station train in the Waverley and then either a sprint in the pissing rain to the pub or a taxi and then you're sitting in a bar surrounded by people that you don't really want to be with you know, guys spilling pints over the top of you when you're trying to have your whiskey um, and then uh, you're thinking mm, am I going to go for the half train or the 11 o'clock train and it ends yeah. up you're out for six hours yeah yeah and, yeah and, 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 and it cost you a lot of money on top of it it's, right? it's that, that, that's a big thing for us. Is you're sitting in your living room and you're still speaking yeah. to all your friends. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's a big thing for us. Is it, we we thought when we started the virtuals, it was going to be mostly locals, and then it kind of grew to you know uh, we've we've had Roy, uh, uh, Rob, and Charlie and Dave here commenting tonight. Um, guys, we probably wouldn't have met without the the virtual tastings, but it, it grew, and we thought. It's it's opening up your market to so many people who you know the the locals are, are is the other thing that we thought was going to have you know that that's what we thought but didn't realize how many others were going to be involved but kind of what, what am I saying the uh, the locals who are now coming it's not the people who we had local coming into the shop to do the tastings it's new men it's people who are two two miles out five miles out who would have to get a taxi. Have to get a child minder, have to get home, scoff their tea, get the wife to drop them off, or the the partner to drop them off. And it's like these these people were actually if we're going to sit home and do it, it's great because um, you don't realise it for them to come to the tasting, they have to pay the the twenty five thirty pound for the tasting, but they also have to pay thirty quid to the babysitter or taxi. So if it ends up, you know, it could cost for one person to come to the tasting hundred quid. Yeah, and it's like. But it's become a regular thing for a lot of people. I mean, uh, there's there's a guy who uh, who I know who's um, f famous for being a huge fan of Glen Scotia. Um, um, I won't mention his name just in case, but he he's had 250 tastings this year, um, and he said, "Is this is this too much?" Um, he obviously just enjoys the events. Um, but the other thing is that you, you you've no idea where you're reaching when you actually switch on the phone when you switch on the uh, admit button. I always assume everybody's in Aberdeenshire because that's where we mm. are. Mm. And then when people start speaking, you're saying hello and stuff. That's not an Aberdeenshire accent. Well, that's fair enough. It's a, it's a very cosmopolitan uh, population up here. But then everybody's talking that language. You're like, okay, right, wh wh where are you guys actually from? Oh, we're from St. Robbins. Oh, all right, okay, cool. Like, all of you? Yeah, 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 we're all family. Cool. Anyway, um, this is a rum tasting. Um, 
this is great, but why why did you choose Inverurie? And they're like, well, you guys were the only ones that were actually providing a rum tasting online. Like, oh, wow, okay, brilliant, fantastic. Um, so it, it's, it's having that reach, it's having that kind of, which you would never have had before, you know, me, meeting people from the south of England and stuff like that, that hopefully are now going to spend more time in, in Scotland when they come on holiday, come and see us and come and spend time yeah. with us. But we would have had the opportunity to uh, if it had it not been for COVID and ended up having to do things online, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's I, I, what started off, like we say, with a, with a Facebook Live. Um, I think it's, the first one was the, uh, the uh, Glen Alicky would finish and then it was the, the boutique Yeah. Uh, release. Uh, and then it was a case where the feedback was, Mike, you're just making us jealous. We're, you're going to have to give us some of that drams. And that's where we thought, right, let, let's pour some drams and people could buy it from the shop and pick the it truth, up. The truth, is, the truth is, mate, we didn't want to watch you while we were all sober. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> but, yeah, so um, that, that's kind of, we, we normally try and restrict this to an hour. That's been an hour and a half. We, yeah. We've been yeah. living it on. It's been absolutely fantastic. And, you know, normally I would be... Yeah, let, let, let's get going. Um, let, let's not take up everyone's time. But I'm just, I'm a Liverpool fan. I'm just really, we're going to beat one 0 by Man United. So I'm quite happy to carry on and forget the football. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, no, in, in all seriousness, Bruce, uh, Russell, you're not going to get a, a, a share of that Highland Park. Um, Park it. It's, it's gone. But certainly the the Glen Marvelous, you'll, you'll get a, a wee drop of. Uh, it's it's been a great uh, pleasure to talk to you again, Bruce. Uh, keep up the good work because your whiskey is fantastic, and uh, it, it goes. I know a lot of people have been introduced to you through the uh, the Jim McEwen range, but you know, let, let's hope that they realise the full extent of what you do, uh, and one day this can become your your full time job. Yeah, absolutely, I've been I've been saying it for about the last three years. <laughs> <laughs> I think the thing is with the, with, the, with independent bottlers, uh, Bruce, you know, from a shop point of view, sometimes you're you're people will come in and say, um, "I want to buy a bottle of whiskey for so so and so," and you you go through a, a, a process and you'll 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 mention a four or five from a distillery and you'll put in a couple from independent bottlers. When people don't know, they they they'll kind of glaze over when you mention because they're like, oh, what, "What are they? I don't understand that." That's a distillery. Yeah, I'll take from a distillery. Um, but we are really, really, really keen to promote uh, more independent bottlers. Um, so we, we want to make that um, a more kind of positive experience. And it's something that's actually people are starting to get more involved with. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely something to grow. And we're more than happy to continue to promote. Good, um, thank you. Yeah. Absolutely. We, we, we did have a brief chat. I haven't kind of followed up on it. We've just been absolutely mental. But certainly um, to become a retailer for... For a full is certainly on my list of objectives. So there's a space on the shelf. There's a space on the shelf. Don't tell Janice that. Yeah. Don't tell Janice that. <laughs> yeah. Well, we can we can we can sort you out. There's there's, there's no problem when you get an allocation of the the drum full balls. The, the John McEwen, maybe not. But <laughs> <laughs> there's some there are some there are some bottles that never make the shelf. But uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, certainly the the. the <laughs> Yeah, the drum full. Um, yeah, I can, I can, I can sort it. Well, that would be good. Um, yeah, we'd, we'd love that. The yeah. guys would love it. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Good stuff. Right, guys. Well, I'll, I'll let you enjoy the the rest of your evening. Um, thanks everyone to who joined in. Uh, thanks for all your comments and questions. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. And this has been officially our longest blether. Uh, and yeah. that's you, Bruce. You you give so much information. It's clear that you. You're passionate about it and telling us the stories that you you've got. It's been the easiest one for me and Russell to do. <laughs> we haven't had to talk very much at all. What, what, what you try? What you try to say? I talk too much. <laughs> no, no. I'm no, trying to say that you, you talk just, just you talk just enough. Yeah. A wealth of you. Well, you well, talk just you, enough that we don't have to. Thank you very much for having me on. I've, I've really enjoyed it. It's been good chatting with you. I've really enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, you keep up the good work too, because you're doing a great job up there with that shop. The, the whiskies you're getting there are fantastic, and uh, yeah. that. Uh, that um, Glen Alicky you had with your own name on it, that's a, that's a belter. That's one of the whiskies of the year for me. Uh, used it in a couple of tastings and it went down a storm. 
Right. Yeah, yeah. We, we thank you for for uh, using it because we we got such a great feedback from it. Um. So so yeah, I can't thank you enough for doing that. Um. So we we have about a hundred bottles left of it. So we'll see. But eight of those, I'm, I'm keeping four myself. Like like you say, you always want to keep a little bit back for yeah. for yourself because it's a shame to get rid of it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Be good to meet you sometimes, Bruce. It'd be good if uh, we can come down or you can come up. Yeah, it'd be great to catch up with you. Yeah, I'll be up sometime. Don't worry. Good. Brilliant. Cheers. Right, guys. Um, join us uh, next week. We haven't got somebody in for next week, but we're working on it. We're just waiting for confirmation. And uh, in a couple of weeks, I think we have a, a great guest. Uh, but I don't want to say too much until we, we have everything confirmed. Um, What's uh, David saying? He needs two at the end of the month. David, you need two at the end of every month. You, you, <laughs> what, what makes this month any different? <laughs> uh, okay, guys. Um, thanks very much. Uh, we'll see you hopefully in the shop, uh, or if not, online at one of our tastings. Uh, thanks very much for joining us. Good night.